G'day guys, Jared Powell here. Welcome to another installment of Shoulders of Giants, where I have interesting conversations with interesting people. So today we're talking to Alex Scott. Uh, Alex is a Canadian physiotherapist who has done his PhD in the area of tendon pain. He's a prolific uh, tendon researcher and has been for a number of years now. We discuss a bunch of uh, topics within the tendinopathy space. We look at the nomenclature, what do we call tendinopathy? Is it tendinopathy, tendinitis, and why? We hypothesize as to where the pain in tendinopathy is actually coming from. And then we look at interventions to manage tendinopathy. We look at loading, we look at pharmacotherapy, we look at various other modalities that are deemed as more passive, and we try to find the hard evidence behind it. I very much hope you enjoy today's conversation with Dr. Alex Scott, and I'll catch up with you next time. Okay, Alex, thank you for coming on and agreeing to have a chat with me. Um, so I'll formally introduce you, Alex Scott. Uh, you're a Canadian, I believe, from, from Vancouver. I don't know if that's where you're originally from, but that's certainly where you're based now. Uh, you're a physiotherapist, you've done your PhD, and you have an interest in tendon pain. And I've certainly read a bunch of your research over the years. Probably started with uh, the, the, the paper you did with Karim Khan on uh, mechanotherapy or mechanotransduction, which really was a, a great introduction for me to start to think a little bit more about what exercise can do and what loading can do because I honestly at that time 10 11 years ago thought that it was just about getting stronger and it was simply about hypertrophy but the application of a physical load can have far greater consequences on all sorts of tissue from tendon to cartilage to ligament to bone to any bioactive uh, I guess structure so, so that was a really fascinating insight and then you have continued to research away over the last decade or more and I think when I looked at your research gate profile you've you've got your name on over 140 papers so that's quite productive so well done <laughs> so awesome. I'll hand it over to you if you just uh, give us a sort of brief background on you and and how you got into research attendance well thanks Jared it's, it's really good to talk to you you know we we've, we've met not too long ago and had some already some really interesting talks and I'm really curious about where you're headed in this field too, bringing this, the psychology, the tendons. Um, so I, I, just, I just love being in a field where I can learn. And thank you so much for the opportunity to, you know, get to have a conversation and hopefully somebody will find it interesting. Um, I very much enjoyed working on that mechanotherapy paper with, with Karim Khan. And I do want to credit him as, you know, the, the, the providing the leadership and the insight on that paper. I learned a lot from writing that with him. And I've continued to research some of those pathways that are talked about in, in the mechanotherapy model. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, physiotherapists as movement experts, you know, it's on us to really have as deep an understanding as we can about what's the influence of, of, of exercise, of movement on the tissues. Um, how can we use that knowledge to design new treatment strategies? So I'm glad that you connected with it because that was more of a, you know, a, a, a thought experiment and a, and a you know, a model that we can use to think about. Um, so I'm really glad that you connected with it. And um, yeah, so I've been a physio since 2000. Um, I always knew I wanted to stick around in research. Um, by the time I graduated as a physio in 2000 here in uh, British Columbia, I really uh, swallowed the pill, you know, about evidence-based medicine. And our, we were really being hammered on it back in 2000 <clears throat> that physios really needed to pull up our socks. And I actually took the message probably too seriously because I was sort of like, oh, I'm, I don't think I'm ready to go into practice now. And I don't know, I'm not certain about any, any of this. Um, so I decided the best thing I could do was stick around in academia. So I started applying for the fellowships and all the rest of it and, and was gradually able to put together a research career um, at UBC. And so I've stopped working clinically now, but this is the part I love the most is that's how I can serve the profession. Um, and uh, the tendon interest really came from um, approaching Karim Khan, looking for a PhD mentor. And so that was just very lucky to connect with him. Uh, and he set me up with one of his collaborators, uh, a biochemist here at EBC. And so I got a sort of dual training uh, in some laboratory techniques 
and then also the clinical side of it and just just kept going with it and gradually uh, sort of put together a mix of basic science and then pivoting more into some actual clinical studies in the last little while, which I hope I'll get a chance to talk about. Great. Yeah. So, so, so if I could summarize a little bit of your own insecurity led you down this pathway of yeah. academia to, in order to maybe allay some of those insecurities that you, you may have had. And that, that's a really fascinating uh, insight because we're I, all- I think that's fair to say. Yeah, that's why I have so much empathy for free and love talking to people who are on the front lines, you know? Mm. So I really get, get it. That's why you're hungry for the knowledge. That's why presumably people have clicked on this link because they want to learn more uh, about and that they can use that in the practice. So I, I really respect that in you and all the listeners. Yeah, because that's, that's what it's all about, right? We, we certainly don't know everything and learning is a, a lifelong pursuit. And, but as long as you're committed to learning, then I think it's fair. It's the people who have shut off and have shut off for a long period of time and, and don't want their opinions or beliefs challenged on any certain topic. I think that's where the, the problem arises. So thanks, thanks for the, 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 the background there. It's, it's very interesting. So I think we, what we want to start with is, or what I want to start with, if you don't mind, is the nomenclature or the naming of tendon pathology or tendon pain. So certainly I know when I first started getting into exercise science and then ultimately physiotherapy, the prevailing term that I knew of was, was tendonitis. And then when I started physiotherapy in a, about 10, 11 years ago, uh, tendinosis became more popular and then it's obviously uh, trended towards tendinopathy. And I've know, I know you've written a paper recently on this topic. So would you just speak to the nomenclature around tendon pain? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question because words are really important because that sets right away uh, what are we labeling as the most important thing in this condition? What are we focusing on? And you know how you think about something influences how you then approach it as the problem that you're trying to solve. So you know, I think the initial paradigm shift away from tendonitis, uh, which was really pushed by by my PhD supervisor Karim Khan, has had a, a wonderful effect on the field because it's it's basically acknowledged that taking anti-inflammatory drugs or creams is is not an effective cure for this condition. So if we if you go in as a patient and you think I need to settle down this inflammation in my tendon and then I'll uh, be able to get back to normal again, that's sort of setting yourself up for failure. And uh, as we've talked about, it kind of distracts you from what you can be doing rather than receiving an anti-inflammatory treatment. What can you be doing to help rehabilitate your tendon? So I think the transition to using the term tendinopathy was really important because it says there's a pathology, there's a problem in your tendon and you're the only person that can fix that. It's not something that can come external. You have to change the loading conditions in your tendon to make it healthy again. So, the, the, yeah, you're right, that term tendinosis um, was presented as an alternative to tendinitis in the early days. Um, it made a bit of, a, bit, a, bit of a, uh, a run in the 90s, and it was really defined as tendon pathology, which is not inflammatory. Um, so that's ten tendinosis, but it was always recognized that tendinitis and tendinosis, these are terms which imply a knowledge of the underlying cellular uh, pathology, uh, which is something that we as clinicians don't have. Like we, we really can't tell at a cellular level what's happening in that tissue. So that's why we prefer the more um, umbrella term of tendinopathy. It's not presuming to know whether there's maybe a bit of acute inflammation in there, whether there's some activation of inflammatory pathways. We don't know that and we don't necessarily care. We just want to focus on the tendinopathy. Um, that was a consensus that we came to last year when we, when we got together. And surprisingly, we, no one could actually agree on what tendinosis was anymore. So I think we may see that term starting to fade away. Yeah, tendinosis for me is a bit of an obscure or ambiguous term. It, for how I conceptualize or interpret tendinosis is just, more of a sort of macroscopic appearance of, of a tendon on an, on an image or a scan or on a sample. It doesn't really relate to symptoms. That's how I look at it. It's just, it's just a thing that you see. And tendonitis, is, itis seems to be inextricably linked with inflammation. So I think that one speaks for itself. But I think tendinopathy captures all of that as well as pain and functional 
uh, limitation or functional issue, which is why someone presents to you in the first place. We don't really care if something looks strange on a scan if it's not really affecting that person's quality of life at that point. And and I think you just you we we touch, uh, you touched on it just then, and we talked about it before off air, is that the naming of a pathology or a clinical presentation is really underrated in terms of how the patient or the client perceives their diagnosis or reacts to a diagnosis. And it sets up the management. And we talked about subacromial impingement, which is a term that I really want us to move away from as a profession. That sets us up for a very, very biomedical intervention or a management plan. It's the exact same with tendonitis. It implies inflammation which implies rest and anti-inflammatory and uh, a very passive approach, whereas tendinopathy isn't tarred with that same brush. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree more. Um, it'd be towards the end if we get to looking at some new results we've had coming out, we find even in the context of a research study where you're giving an anti-inflammatory as part of the study, it, it does seem to distract people from doing the rehab and then the, you can end up with worse outcomes. You know, you, you come in with a cream trying to help things out and then uh, you end up distracting people from doing the rehab. Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess it's a, that's something that every clinician has to make their own decision about how the patient's going to, going, going, to, going to interpret them coming in with something to try and calm the tendon down, which could occasionally be helpful, but it, it, is, it is definitely something to keep in mind that you don't distract from the, uh, from the loading. Precisely. You've got, to, you've got to put that as the central ingredient or the champion of your intervention and then everything else is more of an adjunct around that. But I think terminology is key and there is a big push towards, you know, using more appropriate words and, and going away from nocebic and potentially fear inducing terms, which, which is hard to do. And sometimes, you know, I slip out tent, like inflammation in, in, at the wrong time or degeneration or wear and tear and all these sorts of terms because it's it's a habit, I guess, and but but people hang on to those terms, and we would be surprised as to how much it actually affects the recovery down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just final point on that would be, you know, when, when like you said, you see something a little bit unusual on in someone's tendon on a scan. Um, the, the knee jerk reaction for most people is, oh, there's something wrong with that. There's some some pathology in the tendon. It may or may not be symptomatic, but there's some pathology there. But but I mean, that's very arguable, right? It's because when when soft tissue heals uh it can be perfectly functional it just doesn't look like it did before it was injured right so maybe what you're looking at is actually healed tissue in, in there um so it's it's can be totally counterintuitive to label out a degeneration or a pathology 100 percent of a variation in structure does not imply a pathological tendon does it and i think i think there's been some work done on that hasn't it with the whole donut theory by by sean docking um out of jill cook's group saying that in in a degenerative tendon there's actually a more uh good structure tenderness structure compared to uh potentially a, a non-degenerative tendon which is which is fascinating absolutely yeah so okay so let's get on to uh etiology and pathophysiology so if, we, if you don't mind we'll start with etiology so why does a tendinopathy begin? Is it aging? Is it overload? Is it underload? Is it genetic? Is it biomechanical? Is it systemic, physiological? Is it all of it? What do you think? I love the way you asked that question because you <laughs> went through pretty much all the major risk factors for developing a tendinopathy. And, um, you're absolutely right. I think the current thinking is it's multifactorial. Um, loading is, is generally considered to be the major risk factor, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Aging could, could be the major factor for, for some people. And um, for most people would be familiar with models of osteoarthritis. And I think we accept that um, osteoarthritis is multifactorial, you know, that a, that a prior injury can set you up, that a, a unusual or, or unaccustomed loading can set you up for it. Um, so I think tendinopathy is, is, is very much the same way. The, the first part of your question is really challenging though, because what's the initiating event? And, and that's where the contrast with osteoarthritis sort of breaks down because we've got 
um, thousands of research papers and, and billions of research dollars invested into osteoarthritis and picking apart the cellular and molecular mechanisms. And we're really still scratching the surface with mm. endonopathy etiology research. Um, we don't even still have an agreed on animal model that, that experts would, would say uh, represents important aspects of the condition. Um, for the animal models that we do have, like one that I've used is the rabbit Achilles overuse model. Um, for many years, that was put forward as the best animal model because it, it's uh, just, just through inducing some, some kicking in the rabbit foot, you get um, an Achilles tendinopathy, which looks very similar to uh, human Achilles tendinopathy pathology. And it goes through an early stage where you have an inflammatory reaction which is concentrated in the paratendon and in the endotendon, those vascularized areas. And then it seems to spread to influence the, the nearby um, areas of the tendon proper, the load-bearing tissue. So in, in my mind, you know, having looked at that rabbit Achilles tendon biopsy model, it's kind of, it's, it's driven by load-induced changes in the paratendon and the endotendon, which then spills over and influences the neighboring tendon cells. Uh, uh, and then the matrix starts to break down as a result of that. Mm. That only really duplicates that very er the very early stages, and it doesn't really lead to um, you know the, the the sort of more chronic um, um, tissue pathology that we would see in humans in late stages. So trying to put together all the different pieces and see how they fit together, we, we still don't have that that picture in place. Mm. Yeah, um, fascinating. So, so just I'll just sort of speak uh, for a moment there. It's so could we say that so load seems to be central to 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 the onset of symptoms somehow, but could we say that potentially age or or genetic factors? Because I know there are some genes that have been linked with with the with tendinopathy, potentially things like metabolic syndrome uh, and 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 some other factors. Can they make a person more vulnerable to fluctuations in loading? And that sort of is, is the straw that breaks the camel's back that leads to symptom onset. So what would you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think we're going to get to a point where for osteoarthritis, we have primary OA and then we've got secondary OA. Uh, you know, with secondary OA, we know that there's other medical conditions that can result in problems in the cartilage and in the joint. And in it, I think somebody at some point should put together the same model for tendinopathy. So we've got primary tendinopathy, where we know loading is important. And then there's also all the factors that relate to the underlying health of the tendon. So your genetic predisposition, um, your, uh, your age, uh, right, which relates to your ability to heal as well. Uh, and as well as uh, the stiffness, you know, the load tolerance of your tissue as we age, we tend to lose some of that load tolerance. So that's, that obviously can set you up for problems. Um, you could be doing the same loading, but as you're aging, your load tolerance is, is declining. Um, so at a certain point, um, you're now that, that same, same amount of loading, now your tissue can't tolerate it anymore. So you start to enter into that injury biology cycle. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's really that's really well said. So your your loading could remain here, but your capacity, as it were, can be sort of subtly reducing over time, which may set you up for an overload at some point. Uh, which is which is a really which is that that really sort of makes clinical sense, doesn't it? You often see people who come in and like, oh, I've been doing this amount of exercise for 10, 15 years. I don't get why now, but there's a lot going on under the surface at a molecular and cellular level that may sort of indicate that that's, that, that's fine. Your load has remained, but biologically something may have changed uh, underneath the hood of the car, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're, we're, we've been aging for those last 10 years. And, you know, I, I don't think we've, we've got that kind of a study, but if, if you gradually track somebody's tendon uh, load tolerance, you know, and it always their tendon stiffness, over time, the human studies show that, that you lose that as you age for whatever reason. I don't think we know exactly why yet, but um, mm -hmm. the cells just aren't producing as high a quality matrix um, as they were when you were younger. It's just, it's not, just I, entropy. It's just uh, things, <laughs> things trend towards chaos over, over a period of time, and we can't, we can't uh, 
We can't get around the laws of physics at some point. <laughs> I knew you were a philosoph philosophical kind of guy. So I'm fine with that. <laughs> Good. So, so that's maybe, okay. So we're, we're happy with maybe the etiology in terms of we've got, we, we've got a basic idea of potentially factors that seem to be involved with, with the onset of a pathological tendon. So, th so, and you've also described a little bit of, of the pathophysiology. So what's the general cascade from that first reaction in the paratendon and then what follows that? What's the clinical course typically? You know, it's, it's just bits and pieces of the puzzle are still emerging on that. Um, so I was really excited to read a paper that came out last year from Copenhagen by Philip Tran. Um, it was the biggest study I'd come across of 200 um, individuals uh, who had either Achilles or patellar tendinopathy. And they, they got them at the very earliest stage. So they had either one, two, or three months symptom duration. And they took biopsies and they took imaging and, uh, and they were able to, they were trying to put together that early time course, uh, what happens over those first three months of symptoms. Mm. And uh, it looks like the tendon uh, was thickened right from the start and stayed thick. Um, there was no change in biomechanics, which was really interesting that the tendon stiffness uh, was no different in uh, compared to the uh, asymptomatic side. Yeah, so okay. that, that surprised me. I, I thought the biomechanics would be one of the first things to go, but apparently not. It didn't get thickened. And uh, there was evidence they, they didn't get uh, biopsies from Achilles and patellar, just from the patellar bio, uh, tendons. But there was increased uh, levels of substance P and also mm -hmm. TGF beta, which is really fascinating because substance P is painful, right? If you inject substance P into your skin or into your tendon, it hurts. And we know that the tendon cells are producing more of it. We know that especially the, uh, the paratendon cells and those cells in the interfascicular matrix, when you repetitively load them, they produce all kinds of inflammatory substances. Um, so, you know, it's capable of being produced by the tendon right from an early stage. And um, so that may be emerging as a contender for what's uh, causing some of that nociception right from the start. The interesting thing about substance P too is it can drive some of that pathological change, right? So substance P uh, stimulates the mast cells to degranulate. They release all, all kinds of angiogenic and, and fibrosis uh, encouraging factors into the area. So you, you start to get this kind of low grade uh, fibrosis or tissue repair type reaction that's starting to happen. And I think if, if the loading continues and the substance P keeps getting produced and keep getting released, those, uh, that fibrosis just gradually accumulates and, and you're going further and further down the tendinopathy path. So that's, that's probably what happens. You know, one of the reasons I say that is the substance P, it's also present in, at higher levels in the later stages of the, of the condition. Um, it's present in the animal models. And just recently we found out that if you block substance P um, in a rat overuse tendinopathy model, you actually prevent some of that uh, tendon pathology from, from developing. So I know there's a couple of trials happening right now to see if um, blocking substance B signaling in people who have tendinopathy actually increases their pain levels. And that, you know, that's gonna be a key piece of evidence because that would, that would clinch that this is, uh, this is an important part of the pathway. So drugs like ketamine, for example, um, can you inject that locally and influence someone's pain levels or can you apply it topically and bring their pain levels down? Some of the other things which also cause some, some analgesia um, for tendons like the um, is, is known to act uh, at least in part through the substance P pathway. So that's, that's one model anyway, you know, it's like I said, it's pretty, it's pretty early days. We're still looking at different pieces of the puzzle as they emerge. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. So if we, if we just sort of zoom out a little bit and, and, try and, and try and sort of piece it together with pain and what pain is, it's interesting to think about. So we think that there may be some sort of initial cellular reaction that prompts the release of substance P. Substance P sensitizes our nociceptive pathways. 
which maybe can lead to the onset of pain. And then substance P does some other things as well in terms of the, 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 the fibroplastic changes or, or whatever within the tendon. But maybe that substance P at the first stage is, is, uh, is, is telling our brain or our central nervous system or our consciousness that, hey, this amount of loading or whatever you're doing down here is not, is not a good thing for this tendon in terms of uh, my, uh, my, the ability of this tendon to flourish in the world. You need to protect, you need to stop, you need to reduce loading. And then it, if, if loading continues, then it continues to kind of increase the, the cross-sectional area of the tendon to try and make it more adept at, at handling load. It's, it, it's, it's fascinating to think that if we actually inhibit substance P, are we sort of changing our normal biological reaction to overload? What do you think about that? That's a, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, why is the body producing this in the first place? There must be a reason for it. And you said part could be part of that threat detection system, but the mm. fact that substance P also has a local influence on the tissue is, is really interesting. Um, so is it just an adaptation process that's that's gone wrong, you know? Or if, if we if we start to interfere with the substance P, are we going to are we going to potentially make things worse? You know, because you, you can get fooled by thinking mechanistically. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's fun to do it, but really we're we're going to need to wait for the clinical trials to see if any mm. of this um, ends ends up uh, being useful at the end mm. of the day. But I, I, I like the way you put it that it's basically. Um, you know, there's some nociception coming from the tendon tissue, probably being produced locally by the tendon cells. Um, we know from other work coming out of uh, Oxford and Glasgow that, you know, we always thought macrophages um, weren't playing a big role, but maybe potentially more in the shoulder than in other tendons, but they're finding substantial numbers of macrophages, particularly in early stages. And we've got a really great way of doing ultrasound guided biopsies from painful rotator cuff uh, before it's ruptured. And then they compare that to healthy tissue or they compare it to a uh, later stage uh, where, where the tissue is actually ruptured. And it's, uh, the level of macrophages kind of seems to, seems to spike in that painful tendinopathy. And then, and then they're still present at the ruptured stage, but to a lesser extent. Mm. Um, so maybe different tendons have, have slightly different phenotypes, you know, because the, sh the shoulder tendon has a lot of bursa right next to it, which is highly cellular. Um, and I think, some of the classic studies have shown that cells can get recruited out of the bursa into the tendon. But um, absolutely, uh, another one that's really interesting is prostaglandins. So that's the classic inflammatory pathway. And we know that they're also uh, produced by tendon cells um, in response to cyclic loading. And they're really interesting because they actually sensitize um, mechanically activated nociceptors. So, you know, tendons have this population of nociceptors in them, which are usually only activated by high threshold, by, by noxious stimulus, by, by really high loads. <clears throat> but in the presence of cytokines and inflammatory substances, the threshold of those nociceptors is lowered so that uh, a movement that normally isn't painful actually starts to become interpreted as, uh, as, as threatening, you know, because it's activating those nociceptors. So yeah, yeah, it's just uh, it's it's fun to think about this stuff, but you know, as I said, it hasn't really played its way through into any new clinical strategies yet. Yeah, and whether it does is another question as well. You know, this this maybe this is just a a philosophical uh, pursuit with trying to understand it, which is a, a certainly a worthy pursuit, but but maybe it doesn't have to result in some sort of dramatic revolution of how we manage tendinopathy because I think at its heart, it's, it's, it's got to come back. Like pain, like pain can be maladaptive, but pain is also very adaptive uh, from an evolutionary perspective. So if we want to always diminish pain and take away pain, then we're taking away a huge part of our ability to thrive in the world. So I think, I think it's always going to come back to, or it should always come back to, increasing function and increasing capacity and increasing the ability of a tendon and a muscle and a person to do something as opposed to maybe inhibiting um, the whole biological process, which it may have a role, I think, in persistent and chronic cases or maybe severe cases. Um, 
but certainly not in every case. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I was listening with great interest to what you just said. Um, mm. I should be taking notes. I, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've only had a couple of students who are getting into the pain literature more recently, and so I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot in this area. Um, but um, definitely I'm interested in, in this concept and, and especially the science behind how we can increase the tendons load capacity because um, I think that is a big part of what we're doing. Um, in the clinic. It's just that we're often operating in, 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 in a gray zone like because we, we don't have a good outcome measure for tendon load function the way we do for muscle strength, for example. Um, mm. so yeah, I have no doubt that somebody who goes through a tendon rehab program um, very likely a big part of that is making their tendon stronger, but that's that's just a hypothesis. I, we don't have any way to measure that routinely in the mm. clinic right now, so I, I would mm. love to get there. Yeah, the capacity the capacity um, term is a really popular term at the moment. Same with resilient and robust and all these terms as well. I, I don't know if there's uh, the the definition of capacity that I um, seem to come back to is the one by Jill Cook is essentially it's the ability of a person or a tissue to do something without pain or injury resulting. So it's just doing what they want to do without pain or injury arising. And I think I think it need, I think that even though it seems nebulous and a little bit ambiguous, I, I think that's okay. That that is what it is. So when when it comes back to our interventions or our loading prescriptions, all we really need to think about, and I think that we can get or I I have been known to get too deep into the the molecular biology of it all, but really all we care about is, well, this person wants to run for five kilometers every Saturday. How do we reverse engineer that to get that Achilles or patella um, to be able to handle the loads of that? So, so that will therefore dictate the rehabilitation regime that you prescribe, whether they need to, not every person needs to go on and do box jumps for their patella tendons, right? But not every person has to do heavy plyometrics or, or whatever. So I think when we think about capacity, it, it, it maybe just makes us see the clinical picture a bit better. So this person's knee needs to be able to do that. How do I get that knee there? So, so whilst we can get sort of, I don't think we get carried away. I think it's very important work sometimes for the clinician on the front line, worrying about substance P and, and all of these, these very specific chemicals. I'm not sure it's helpful. That's interesting you say that. Yeah. Because, um, obviously, the continuum model has been very successful. Uh, I know in Australia, in particular, right? Um, it's mm. it's it's a very uh, widely known model. And I was always interested that the, the goal there seemed to be to try and use pathological concepts to guide clinical management. And and I I do wonder sometimes if that's if that's really helpful um, or to what extent um, that that actually can guide management. It's an interesting mm. one because um, the continuum model broke tendon pathology down into three stages. If I remember, there was the reactive stage, the disrepair stage, and then the degeneration phase. Mm. Uh, this is an interesting one for you. How, how do your clients react to that language around degeneration? Like, do, do, do they benefit from being told that they've got a degenerative tendon? Um, I, can, I can see how the language around reactive can be quite helpful. Um, I would... When I was in physio school, we just called those tissues irritable, right? If you have a, a tendon that's more acutely painful and needs to be settled down, um, we would say that that tissue structure is irritated. And we didn't really get into the substance P or we didn't try and figure out what was actually happening at the tissue level. We just said, well, oh, that's, that's irritable right now. And um, it's yeah. interesting that the continuum model actually, towards the end of the paper, it boils down into two concepts rather than three. It's sort of reactive or degenerative or combinations of the two so um yeah no that's that's really that's a really good point i in my practice i use irritable versus non-irritable or sensitized or or that sort of language i don't i certainly do not draw a reactive to disrepair to degenerative i think i think that model has been helpful in sort of saying that tendon pathology may be a spectrum and that even if you have a degenerative structure, 
then that does not mean you can uh, not be pain free, for example. So I think that was very helpful for clinicians. I don't know as such, as how helpful it is for patients or for people with tendon pain, but I'm certainly more in the camp of you have an irritable tendon right here, right now, that's fine. We can reduce some load and do some other things if we need to, but the heart of this needs to be a progressive increase in activity uh, or a structured rehabilitation regime to increase the capacity of that tendon. Yeah, so I, I definitely don't sort of list out anything too specific in terms of mm. reactive and, and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Mm. I'm glad to hear yeah. it's been useful. Yeah. Yeah, no, it certainly was. And I think when it, because when it came out, I think, and you probably know more about this. You you were you were probably deep in research at that point, but I, I it was probably was it the first model to really sort of say that that tendinopathy can be a progression or or a spectrum, and that um, even if you have a structure that looks pretty bad on an ultrasound or an MRI scan, this doesn't need to be painful or symptomatic, and it doesn't and the, the model really. Uh, articulated that you don't need to normalize structure in order to be pain free. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that, that probably is the most important thing that came out of that model rather than some of the specifics of, you know, yeah. the underlying histopathology and, and whatnot, which has sort of changed and moved on from, from then. Mm. Um, I, I was interested to come, I came across a paper from earlier this year by Wes Matthews where they're starting to finally look at developing the ultrasound criteria for staging tendons. Um, and I'll be really curious to see if they can, if they can, if they're able to get this correspondence between the imaging and then the, yeah. this, this stage and the prognosis and so on. Um, so it's taken, I guess, about 10 or 11 years since the model was put out for people to begin the, the, the task of trying to see if you can actually accurately put tendons into, into those different stages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the classic, isn't it? These things take a, a period of time after an idea is, is set out there. But it, it was, it's fascinating how quickly we actually uh, integrated the continual model into practice. And these things usually take decades for it to get from research into clinical practice and certainly into university curricula. But it seemed like this model really exploded onto the scene and was widely uptaken which I don't, I don't know if there's any reasons for that, but maybe it just sort of struck a, struck a chord, you know, and, and, and it, it resonated with a bunch of musculoskeletal therapists. Do, do you, could you hypothesize any reason for why it kind of became popular so quickly? No, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree on that. Like you said, I was, I was neck deep in research at the time. And I, I do, Jill was actually here in Vancouver when she was working on the paper, and I remember looking at early drafts of it, and, and um, and then it just sort of took off from there, and um, more power to them. You know, I, I wear a researcher hat when I look at the model, and so I'm all focused on picking it apart and, and finding all the things that I would would have said differently about. Um, and and so you know, I know other researchers in the field have been quite critical of it as well because it really doesn't capture the data coming out of their labs. Um, so it's uh, it's it's probably been more successful. Uh, uptake amongst clinicians rather than researchers who are actually working on tendon pathology. Mm. Yeah, but no, nonetheless, I think it was a um, a good start, you know, and it really propelled quite a lot of research into into tendon. Whether or not it was already happening, it probably was, but it sort of came. It it, it captured the public attention, I think, a little bit more. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think credit to them. It was a it was a, it was a great start. So if we just if we extend that conversation a little bit more and we touched on it a moment ago with with structure and symptoms, a, a key part of an intervention program is increasing function and maybe reducing pain or certainly reducing pain, but we don't have to target pain specifically to reduce pain. What about tendon structure? So after we do a three month or six month or 12 month or whatever loading regime, do we expect to see improvements or 
in tendon structure or resolution of tendon structure at all, or does it remain exactly as pathological as it was uh, when the pain was there? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've probably read some of the studies, uh, just for, for, for some of your readers who might not have, um, there's a pretty good body of literature that's now on the on, on trying to see if there's a relationship between structural outcomes and clinical outcomes. And, um, and, and, and generally the relationship is, is pretty, it's pretty shaky. In other words, you can have somebody with really good clinical outcomes and whose tendon still uh, looks terrible on an ultrasound scan. Um, uh, that said, on the whole, if you look at a whole group of people who are moving through a rehab program over time, generally the trend is that structure starts to normalize in terms of thickness coming down. And um, when we re run research studies here, you always get excited when you see those ones, you know, what's happening in that tendon? You know, you can see the thickness coming down. Sometimes it will be a, a layer of what looks like fluid in the paratendon that disappears over time. And so the whole tendon <clears throat> becomes less thickened. Um, other times, you can't really put your finger on what's changed. The, it, it looks really similar other than the fact that it's just a little bit less thick than it used to be. Um, so, you know, some of the imaging modalities like the ultrasound tissue characterization, the UTC, um, which we've played with here in Vancouver as well. Um, just a, a, a note of caution on those is that the, the, the scheme that's been put out there that there's a histopathology um, uh, uh, underpinning to the, to the green and blue and the red that you see on the ultrasound scans. It, it doesn't actually work that way. Histopathology is on a much finer scale. So you can't mm. see cells and individual collagen fibers on an ultrasound scan. Um, and one thing that can change those UTC values really quickly is the amount of fluid that's in there, right? So it can shift from green to blue, um, black. Uh, a little bit of fluid around the paratendon shows up as red, which is, according to UTC, supposed to be um, amorphous degenerative or I, f I forget what it is actually but it's uh you know it doesn't it doesn't correspond that well um but yeah on average you'll you'll see the structure improving um in a group of people but there's probably more individual variability than than, than there is um and, ha and, and what sort of time scale do we tend to see these improvements in structure are we looking at what sort of time scale is it weeks is it months is it years uh I think areas of fluid can come and go pretty quickly. Um, that could be over weeks, but um, the, yeah, the, the, the structural change is, is at least what you can see on an ultrasound scan happens over a time period of months. Um, it's interesting though, when you think about what's going on in that tendon that's undergoing rehab, um, there's a lot of structural changes happening in there. I would put my money on that you can't see on the ultrasound scan. Um, so we know that a really important determinant of, of the tendon's load capacity is the extent of cross-linking in the tissue. And right now, there's no way of imaging that. But you can have two tendons that look exactly the same, and one is more heavily cross-linked than the other. That, that tendon is going to be a lot stronger. It's not going to look any different. Um, and you know, when you, when you put load through tendon, the, the enzyme that produces those cross-links, lysyl oxidase, that uh, you know, that increases the amount of activity. So it's cross-linking that collagen, making everything stronger again. And um, so there's gotta be a reason that the body is doing that. Yeah, so yeah. that's, and that, 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 that's really fascinating. So we may not have the tools just yet or available to, that are sensitive enough to really detect the internal milieu of what's going on inside there um, with a painful, tendon as it goes from painful to non-painful and there's there's an example in the shoulder as well I'm always going to bring it back to the shoulder hope you don't mind is um and we were talking about this before where there was an Andy Carr's group over in over in England found that macroscopically the tendon of someone with rotator cuff related shoulder pain versus without rotator cuff related shoulder pain looked exactly the same from a macroscopic perspective, but when they did a biopsy and looked at the histology of it, the painful tendon had far greater numbers of uh, glutamate receptors, uh, substance P, and a bunch of other neurochemical um, factors as well. So although it may appear uh, pretty similar, when you actually get down into the, 
the molecular biology of it, there's, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. So, so it's interesting yeah. to think about. Is, so the ultrasound, so the imaging is not really telling the full story, is it? Definitely not. You know, when, when we've done this exercise program in healthy people, um, if you put somebody on a, a heavy isometric loading program for the Achilles, um, you can see 30, 40% increases in, in tendon stiffness after 10 or 12 weeks. Um, that's a pretty dramatic increase in stiffness in mm. the tissue. Um, but there's no change in cross-sectional area. There's no change in the UTC appearance. Um, so we, we definitely don't have the tools at this point. You know, it pro probably does come down to things like cross-linking um, within and between the collagen fibrils. Um, just, just don't have the ability to measure that right now. So can you, can you just um, talk about tendon stiffness? Because for the, for, the, for, the, for the person who doesn't know, stiffness is not range of motion in this context, right? So what are you talking about when you're talking about tendon stiffness? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, tendons have to withstand a lot of a, a lot high loads without breaking. Um, so stiffness in this, in this uh, instance, it refers to the slope on the load deformation curve. So as I, as I, as I load a tissue, you know, how, how much does it stretch, right? And does it take a lot of force to stretch it a little bit? Or can I, can I pull it out really easy? So this would be something stiff and that would be something that's lost in stiffness. So that's eventually you can get to the point where it breaks. So you need, need stiffness to prevent the tissue from, from becoming injured. So the ability to, to resist deformation, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so do we want a stiffer tendon? Is this, what, is this what you're saying? Is it more beneficial to have a stiffer tendon versus a, a less stiffer tendon? Well, it looks like if you've got, if you've got a, at least a, an Achilles tendinopathy where it's uh, been measured pretty well, it's, it's a big tendon, so we can measure the stiffness really well. Um, people with tendinopathy on average seem to have lost uh, of a, no a normal level of stiffness. So for those individuals, um, I would hypothesize that getting that regaining that stiffness is important. The reason being that if if they've lost some of that ability to resist loading, then you know when they when they get out there for a run, when they try and load that Achilles tendon, it's stretching more than normal. Um, so you're getting more strain through the tissue, and I believe that's likely to perpetuate that. Uh, reaction we were talking about where you're you're just uh stimulating the production of those most mm. substances in the tissue you know it's, it's all pretty hypothetical at this point but you know when you if you if you if you see that you've lost a function in the body and my instinct is let's let's try and regain it um it may be that we have this conversation five years from now we find out that actually you know it doesn't matter stiffness doesn't matter you can have a floppy tendon and you're just <laughs> fine but you know i want i want to stay uh, I, want to, I want to come right out here and say I'm going to put some money down on that. I think stiffness is going to turn out to be important. <laughs> yeah, it, it it has to, doesn't it? It's it's a spring, right? So especially the Achilles, and I, I'm not sure how it applies to the upper limb. I'm not I'm not certain that stiffness really matters up there, but certainly for propulsive tendons, and then it makes a lot of sense for stiffness to matter. It's just physics, so it's got to work. So if we talk about uh, let's talk a little bit about management and intervention. We've, we've talked a, a little bit about loading, and that's. I think we'll. I think we'll leave that. We know that we're all physiotherapists, and we've hopefully all read the loading literature. There are many different types out there. We won't speak to it too much. There's heavy slow resistance. There's eccentric. There's isometric. Isometric took took the world by storm five years ago after Ebony Rio's paper. It's since been challenged a little bit. It's not been replicated in the Achilles tendon. Um, so, so there's more work to be done for isometrics. I think it may have a role. I just don't think it's the panacea that we all thought it was at one point. So we're okay with loading. So what are some other interventions that have historically been prescribed for tendinopathy from a pharmacotherapy perspective or from a mm -hmm. modality perspective? Uh, yeah, well, pharmacotherapy, you know, we've got, we've got some pretty good Cochrane reviews that you can look at. Um, corticosteroids, of course, they've been around forever. Um, for the Achilles, I think the Cochrane review, despite the fact that we've been around for decades, still says pretty limited evidence. Uh, as, as, and actually, that's the conclusion for all injection therapies for the Achilles. 
whether it's corticosteroids or PRP or prolotherapy, all these uh, injection therapies, uh, very limited evidence. Um, so uh, on which to base any clinical guidelines there. So um, meaning not, are they, they're often not found to be better than placebo, are they? Uh, yes, PRP, yeah. I mean, here, so, you know, here's an example I'll just share. If it's okay if I share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. So here's a trial that we did of PRP for patellar tendinopathy. Um, it's a little bit small, uh, but this was 57 athletes randomized into three groups. They all received exercise, and they either got the placebo, which was saline, or they got two different types of PRP. The saline is in the light blue, and here's the visa score. So you can see there was actually no statistically no difference between the three groups, but saline came out pretty well, and it's a lot yeah. cheaper than PRP as far as I can mm -hmm. tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there was any trend here, it, didn't, it wasn't significant, but this is actually the pain levels uh, towards the end. The group that received the leukocyte-rich PRP uh, were trending towards not doing as well. Um, kind of makes sense when you think that you're injecting more inflammatory substances into, uh, into a tendon, yeah. considering what we were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, so yeah, the PRP is, is probably uh, same, same findings for the shoulder um, and elbow and Achilles. So I think that one is gradually going to fade away. Um, shoulder, yeah, we talked about corticosteroids, a small transient analgesic effect. Um, have you come across this one in your practice at all? This ultrasound guided lavage? No, no. Ooh, I've seen that presented at conferences, but it's not available here in Vancouver. Uh, mm. But it it's, looks pretty fascinating. They can remove large quantities of calcific sort of paste from people's shoulders and they report big improvements um, in clinical function, but that's not very widely used yet. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, Here's, here's a couple of things that we're working on right now. One is um, <clears throat> taking a traditional rehab program for people with Achilles tendinopathy. Mm. And then we added on to that a dry needling group, it's IMS, that's intramuscular stimulation, mm. or a sham needling. And then just the rehab program by itself. And you can see pretty clearly there, there was no yeah. um, benefit of adding the dry needling. And then this one, this one's really interesting. Actually, this is a topical diplofenac, so that's an anti-inflammatory, which we've previously showed has an acute analgesic effect in people with Achilles mm -hmm. tendinopathy, even in those with chronic symptoms. Um, and in this case, so we said it has a short-term effect on pain. So what happens if we go for a longer time period? So we'll give them four weeks worth of diplofenac and suggest that they use it three times a week. And the clinical improvement here is actually worse than what we tend to see with an exercise-based rehab program. Yeah. So in this case, rather than, rather than giving them a rehab program, we said, you've done physio, you had to have done physio or a rehab program to qualify for the study, because that's unethical otherwise, right? Mm. Um, but we said, just keep doing what you're doing, and then here's your treatment. This is your treatment for the study. And then when we asked people at the end of the study what they had actually done, um, majority of them hadn't done any rehab, hadn't done any exercise during the course of the study. And this type of uh, change in the visa score here, this is not clinically significant. It's um, typical, it's similar to what you'd see with a, a wait and see control. Mm. So I was surprised by this. You know, I thought people would take the cream and they would continue with their rehab and they would maybe yeah. get a better effect. But in this case, uh, maybe the, the, taking the cream actually distracted them from, from doing what they could do. Um, in terms of rehab, so we got worse outcomes. So yeah, medical treatments. Um, actually, I just wanted to highlight one before we go. It's this one by um, uh, Bozen et al. They have a couple mm. of studies on it now. Have you heard of this uh, high volume injection treatment? I have, yeah, I have. I've seen it a couple of times in, in clinical practice too. Lots of sports physicians do it over here in Australia. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. I haven't seen it. I've just read the studies, but one of the reasons I got excited by it was the, the, the size of the effect of big changes in the score. And, mm. and it, it makes sense to me, my understanding of the pathology, um, that when you've got tissue that's undergone a chronic fibrosis reaction, 
we start to lose some of that ability of the fascicles to glide against each other, against the paratendon. So my understanding with the high volume injection is the idea is to get in there under ultrasound guidance and inject a large amount of saline and separate out. So we're actually breaking adhesions potentially between tissue layers. Yeah. And in this case, they included one group was just saline and then the other group had some corticosteroid included in it as well. So I'd be really excited if this um, intervention is replicated by other groups because it uh, makes sense and looks like a big effect size. Other groups can, can come up with that. Yeah, so that kind of, it, it, it almost simulates the, the surgery, doesn't it? The, I know the, the, the Hawkeye Alfredson is yeah. over in London and you've worked with him and I, I worked with him when I was over in London. And um, so it's a very similar procedure to the actual surgery of trying to detether the paratenin from the tendon itself, right? Yeah. Were there other medications that, that you were expecting me to talk about that I didn't get a chance to mention here? Uh, no, that's, that's pretty good. The key one was the, the doclofenac um, and then the, the PRP paper as well. So, yeah. so that, that's pretty good. Um, it's, it's very, so the, the dry needling one was interesting as well. So, so dry needling, no additional benefit to just exercise alone. No. Yeah, that was using a, a gun approach. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's yeah, something yeah. we use yeah. a lot here yeah. in Vancouver. Yeah, so all the patients were assessed, uh, they had to have uh, signs of, of, of neuropathy according to the gun model of evaluation. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to do sham IMS. Um, we didn't actually, we weren't able to fool the patients, the majority of them guessed which group that they were in. Um, which makes it even more interesting that there was no difference between the sham IMS and the true IMS. Because if there was a placebo effect, knowing that you're in the active group, you think those people would have done a little bit better, but it didn't seem to translate. The one thing is they, the IMS group gained slightly more range of motion. Um, it's not really, I don't know if that's an important clinical outcome measure. I suppose it depends on, on what kind of range of motion the person had to begin with. And, and what activity they were, whether that was a limiting factor for them. Um, but possibly the IMS group, the treating therapist knew which group they were in, of course, and is also the one prescribing the exercises. So it's possible that they were just a little bit more diligent about doing their stretching. Yeah. It says, just, just uh, on the high volume injection, I just, I just remembered that, um, have you heard of Dr. Wolfgang Muller over in, over in Munich, Germany? He's a famous sports doctor who treats, he's the Bayern Munich uh, soccer team doctor. Oh, over there. He's, he's famously treated Usain Bolt and David Beckham and a lot of other uh, sports stars who have tendon injuries. And he does these high volume injections. And a colleague of mine over here in Australia was, a, a doctor for a famous uh, Olympian uh, for, for a period of time. And, and she went over to, to him and had this high volume injection and he, he literally injects calf, calf blood, so active vegan, uh, into, the, into the tendon and then saline. And he just, he rips all of the fluid through the paratendon in like a, a massaging way as well. And I don't, I don't know how much of the, the contextual effect and the placebo effect because you're going to see this guy and he costs thousands of dollars. Uh, so a lot of the improvement seems to come out of that. But a lot of these people swear by him and get better. And a lot of our famous sports stars have gone over there as well. So he's been doing these high volume injections for a decade or more. So interesting. Yeah, that's, that's great. We need to get somebody thinking outside the box like that. It sort of fits, you know, like I said, don't know how that would translate to other tendons, but the Achilles, the people who do go to surgery, when they open that tissue up, it's all full of adhesions, you know, it's just stuck down, can't glide properly anymore. And it kind of fits, confirms some of my biases from looking at that, those overuse uh, animal models where you see the changes really concentrated in the vascular, you know, in those sheets uh, around the tendon. Um, and it's not really addressed by other medication therapies or other medical approaches. So. It sounds sounds like you might be onto something. Plausible, yeah. So so how do you think? And, ju and just finally, how do you think? Uh, so how do you think exercise 
therapy works or loading works? Do you think it's working from a mechanical standpoint of improving tendon stiffness? Do you think it's disturbing the adhesions between the paratendon and the tendon? Do you think it's causing hypertrophy? Do you think it's increasing capacity? Is it reducing fear? Is it all of the above? Is it multifactorial and multidimensional like everything else? I love it. That's just circling back to your very first question that you started with. You gave all the answers. Right. It makes it really easy to answer. No, I think it's all of those things. That's the beauty of exercise. It's not just activating one pathway like it. It, it hits all of those things. Um, yeah, it can remodel the tissue. I don't know if the hypertrophy is attended specifically. It, you know, it might be promoting it actually as, as uh, structure starts, as the collagen starts to get stiffer and stronger. Um, and some of that irritation goes down, then the tendon might actually start to um, become less thickened over time. But as we just said earlier, it's not necessarily an important indicator of whether the treatment's working, but definitely um, seems like there's gotta be a psychological aspect to this in there, because you're, you're almost, um, I'm not a psychologist, but um, you're, you're, you're sort of um, like an exposure therapy, isn't it? Because you gradually, teach that person to load the tendon in a safe environment, bringing their sense of threat down. And it makes sense that that would be playing a role. I don't know how mm. anyone's tried to test that hypothesis, but it makes sense to me that it's not just the tendon itself. And certainly yeah. um, not just treating the tendon, you're treating the whole individual, what activity they trying to get back to, the whole kinetic chain. Um, there's a, a guy here at UBC, Chris Nate here. He's the chair of our Sports Physiotherapy Canada. He did a really nice thesis um, looking at risk factors for overuse injuries in healthy women who are training for a half marathon. And the nice part about the study is he followed them from the start of their training when none of them were injured through to the event. And as you expect, quite a lot of them developed an overuse injury during the course of their training. And he found a really powerful risk factor. It was their... Uh, vertical ground, uh, horizontal ground reaction force as they're running. You know how normally when you're running, you think of ground reaction force as the, the ground pushing back up at you. He uh, was measuring them in a biomechanics lab at UBC. It was actually able to measure the horizontal component of the ground reaction force. So he actually he calls it breaking force. Yeah. So I don't know if you're running biomechanics, but breaking force is a concept that's out there. It's basically the ground pushing back at you. you as you move forwards. And um, the longer your stride length, the higher your braking force. And it turned out to be a really big predictor for which women developed overuse injuries. So Chris Napier and, and, and a bunch of others now you see a lot of tendinopathy and other injuries in runners. They really focus on the running biomechanics. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, reducing stride length is an easy thing that you can do to reduce the amount of force through the tendon, for example. Um, but I know that's, that's just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I, knew, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely knew that was a, uh, a theory in terms of the breaking force and the stride length. I, had, I didn't know it had been empirically proven though. So that, that's really quite interesting. I'll, I'll link to that study. So Chris, Chris Napier? Napier. Yeah. So that's in the very first stage of the research is to identify that it's uh, a risk factor. And then of course, clinically, he's already using it, but you're right. We don't have the next stage of the research would be to, to, to do a, a proper prospective study. No, that's that's really that's really cool though. That's that's fascinating. Okay, so future future research, uh, Alex. Is there anything that you think has the ability to revolutionise tendinopathy management, diagnosis, uh, or whatever? I know we've we've touched on it a little bit, maybe with substance T inhibition and a couple of these uh, factors. Is there is there anything else that's going on, or do you think needs to go on? You know, honestly, I, I think what would be the biggest improvement that I would love to see in the future is, is, is people being less quick to jump on the bandwagon for a, new, uh, for a new quick fix or a new magic bullet. And so it's been really tough because we're working in a, in a medical model in the research setting where we're asked to look for mechanisms. That's how you get your research done. You identify a mechanism, and then you target the mechanism, and then you show an effect. Uh, on outcomes, but you know, physios, we're, 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 you know, we're good at doing the multimodal thing. You know, a little bit better this, a little bit better here, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's really hard to test in a research setting. 
Um, but some of the really big effect sizes that I've seen in literature are from groups like Bill Vicencino, where he uses a multimodal research program, this manual therapy, this exercise, this taping, it's whatever the physio uh, and thought would be to think of the same with Teresa Holmgren's work in the British Medical Journal at, um, looking at these rotator cuff tears. It's not just exercise, it's also sort of the steroid injection and manual therapy. I think there might have been another component of that intervention too, but you know what I mean? Multimodal management. Mm. I think um, I'd like to see more research in, in that area. And maybe, maybe that will incorporate another medication strategy, but my, my gut is that's going to be this, a small part of the effect and it's just adding incrementally into a, a more holistic sense of management. Um, so that's, that is a bit of a paradigm shift, but I know people like yourself are promoting that idea of looking at the whole person and trying to think of the whole system rather than just looking at the tendon pathology. Um, I really think that's the way forward. Yeah, I just think it, I, th I just, uh, there's definitely a room for looking at things in a microscopic perspective, but I, I think there's also a place for a macroscopic perspective as well and really trying to figure out why why the person is there in the first place and what they want to get back to. We, we know there's a deluge of research that suggests that motivation and, and sort of goal-oriented treatment is really important both for compliance and adherence to an exercise regime and sort of basic things like self-efficacy and their, their their ability to kind of believe or their belief in their ability to that they're going to get better and so all of these uh, psychological components or affective components to the physical and to the physiological they're inseparable they're all part of a human being so I think it's it's very it's very good that we delineate it from an academic perspective and, and study it, but then we need to bring it all together on the front line when we see somebody come in and we shouldn't just be obsessed with one component of it. Yeah, yeah, even for somebody like me who's very tendon focused, um, for my, one of the next studies that I'm really excited about is um, trialing that Achilles tendon training program for people with, we're gonna do for people with tendinopathy. And rather than just sending them home with a, a little recipe you know, let's say do um, 90 heel drops today for 12 weeks, which is really not very motivating for most people, mm -hmm. is to actually develop um, a little device, a, a rig, where they can press against, uh, it's gonna be either a force plate or um, a tension sensor, which will connect to their phone, and then they can actually have a target, so they know if they're producing a, the, right, the right amount of force, and it can give them a little metronome, and it'll you know, they can hold, they know how long to hold it. They'll, they'll get uh, nice emojis when they finish their training session and it'll log everything. Mm -hmm. um, so just just making the intervention more fun and more motivating can probably um, help a lot of people stick to the program. Yeah, and it's, and it's competitive, right? You're sort of competing against yourself a little bit as well. So you, you, you're motivated to achieve something. It's not just this, abstract concept of I've got to do this number I don't know why I don't know what it's doing the physio said I should do it you know mm -hmm. so it sort of puts the it puts that incentive uh, back in in that person's camp and also cognitively challenging right like it's engaging so that that's a fascinating study what is that is that in the is that are you just in the stages of preparing for that or, or what's going on there yeah it's under review right now um, but I've got a PhD student working on it. He used to be an engineer, so he knows how to do all the coding. And we're just shopping around for uh, tension meters and force plates. And um, I think your point about engaging patients is, is going to be really important. So we'll, we'll actually have some pilot groups with clinicians, with patients, to try and set up the intervention properly. Um, I wonder if COVID, you know, there's going to be a lot of this kind of tension on how can we use technology to get people doing rehab at home more effectively. Um, you know, that's what we're going to try. And of course, we'll, we'll uh, do all, all the biomechanical measures on the tendon too, <laughs> just to make sure we're having an effect on this issue. That's, that's, that's great. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look out for that. Uh, thank you very much for speaking to me, Alex, and everyone about uh, tendons and sharing your wealth of expertise 
on Tendon. We made it through to the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've done well. Um, and they've done well. So yeah, th thanks so much. And uh, I'll, I'll, link for, I'll link to your Twitter uh, for people to find you. And you're always coming out with new research papers. You're very productive. So congratulations on that. But again, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jared. Talk to you later. If you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Alex Scott, on tendinopathy. Make sure you check out some previous conversations I've had with Philippe Struff on the measurement problem of the scapula and also with Kieran Richardson in the non-operative management of ACL injury, which is quite a hot topic at the moment. Uh, you can check these videos out along with a bunch more uh, in my YouTube channel. Cheers.